the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when I bring the sword against the land, and the people of that land take a man, and make him their watchman, then if this watchman sees the sword coming upon the land, and he does not sound the trumpet, so that the people might be warned, then if the sword comes and takes the life of any man among them, that man shall be taken away in his iniquity. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his life. His blood shall I require at the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have made you a watchman. Therefore, hear the words from my mouth, and give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked man, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn him, that he might turn from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his sin, but his blood shall I require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, he will die in his sin. But you, O son of man, shall have delivered your soul. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye nations, and gather yourselves together round about. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley, for there will I sit to judge all nations. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no more strangers pass through her anymore. For centuries, man has believed that an end of this world as we know it would come, an event preceded by signs and wonders, mysteriously shrouded in the pages of prophecy. But as each generation continues, many ask the question, when will it be? 
Still others are adamant, declaring the time is at hand. Bible researchers say that Armageddon is near, and the signs of its happening are increasing every day. Scholars point from the Bible to the newspapers and claim to witness the fulfillment of words scrawled on parchment long ago. But what are they finding? Some say the world is coming together as one, and that this one world will mark the beginning of the end. Man is going back to the Tower of Babel, where all the peoples of the earth were of one speech, and so nothing which they imagined to do would be withheld from them. Man is to unify and build his own stairway to heaven. global economy marches forward. The United Nations cry peace and campaign for world government. Meanwhile, the Pope goes forth as the supposed vicar of Christ to gather all nations into a one world religion. Joining hands with Buddhists, Hindus, voodoo priests and witch doctors, he tells them, we are all praying to the same God. Can these things be setting the stage for what the Bible declared centuries ago? Well, the world, everybody, has multiple good reasons uh, for believing the Bible. You can't escape the Bible. The Bible is primarily prophecy. I think 28, 29 percent of the Bible is prophecy. And uh, most of the prophecy dealt with uh, has already been completed because it dealt with the first coming of Christ. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, God says that he will use prophecy to prove his existence and to prove that the Bible is his word. The Lord says, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. He says that he will tell us what is going to happen before it happens. He will watch over history to make certain that it does. And when it happens, you cannot deny that God exists and the Bible is his word. Now that's absolutely unique. That's one of the, the characteristics of the Bible that demonstrates that it's not just an everyday book out there. It is supernatural because prophecy has been fulfilled to the letter. There's no book like that in the world. The Koran doesn't claim that. Uh, Buddha never uh, claimed that. You know, there, you won't find it in the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Hindu Vedas. You name any religious book in the world, the sayings of Confucius or Buddha or whoever it is, there are no prophecies. Uh, these are not cheap psychic predictions. These are world-shaping, history-making, world-shaking events that have in fact made the history of this world, that the whole world has witnessed their fulfillment and they were prophesied uh, centuries, some of them thousands of years before they happened, and you just can't explain it away. Anybody who's a, a skeptic about this, all they have to do is look to the prophecies dealing with the coming of the Messiah, the first coming, and it lays it all out specifically, where he was going to be born, how he was going to die, uh, just things that no individual, no human being could make up. Well, if all the prophecies of the first coming of Christ have all been fulfilled to the letter, then we could say with uh, great confidence that the other prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. Researchers all over the world put faith in the prophecies of the Bible. Yet there are many who look to outside sources for prophetic insight and information about the end times. Where do unbiblical prophets and their prophecies stand in the Word of God? Isaiah 8:20 mocks them. Why do you turn to spirits that peep and mutter, these wizards? Perhaps the most famous is the 16th century astrologer, Nostradamus, 
and in modern times, the so-called Christian psychic, Edgar Cayce. The prophecies, so-called, of Nostradamus are not straightforward by any means. The Bible lays it out. It names names. <laughs> it names places. You've got to figure them out from Nostradamus. Uh, it's rather obscure and rather ambiguous. Nostradamus is often credited with having predicted the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte. The argument comes from this mysterious quatrain. In the third month, the sun rising, the boar and the leopard meet on the battlefield. The fatigued leopard looks up to heaven and sees an eagle playing with the sun. John Hogue, a best-selling author of Nostradamus prophecies, offers this interpretation. He writes, the third month, June 1815, the boar, this is Napoleon, and the leopard, what Napoleon called the heraldic lion symbolizing England. Normally, the third month would be March, but somehow Hogue has changed it to June to make it fit. He calls the boar Napoleon, though Napoleon's standard was that of an eagle, not a boar. Then, without explanation, he makes the leopard into a lion so it can symbolize England. In another quatrain, Hogue rightly identifies the eagle with Napoleon. But the eagle has also been a symbol for other nations, including Poland, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Hitler's Nazi Germany, and the United States of America. Why Napoleon should be singled out is not explained. Uh, different people come up with different ideas of what does this prophecy of Nostradamus mean, or what does that one mean? And uh, very often they have come up with prophecies, I mean, they thought uh, that didn't turn out. Or then after the fact, they, they think they uh, have found something. You know. For years, people have insisted that Nostradamus predicted Adolf Hitler with his quatrain. Beasts, wild with hunger, will cross the rivers. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hister. Did Nostradamus miss the name Hitler by one or two letters? as many suggest. Pro-Nostradamus author Erica Cheatham admits that commentators before 1930 understood the Hister to be the river Danube from its Latin name Ister. As with Napoleon, Nostradamus adherents must alter what he actually wrote to make it fit. This same author goes on to say that I can dismiss 95% of Nostradamus' predictions as historical coincidence. I wouldn't waste my time on the prophecies of Nostradamus for a number of reasons. Number one, he doesn't even know God. He's not a true prophet of God. Uh, God does not speak for him. In the Bible, this is the claim they make. More than 50 times, Ezekiel, for example, says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying. They are laying it out. They're telling you very clearly that God is speaking through them. Nostradamus doesn't say that. In contrast to biblical prophets, Nostradamus used a form of divination known among witches as scrying. An encyclopedia on witchcraft today defines scrying as concentrating on an object until visions appear. It goes on to say that scrying has been practiced by magicians and witches through the ages. Among the purposes of scrying are predictions of the future. The object on which to concentrate is usually a shiny, smooth surface, such as the crystal ball used by gypsy fortune tellers. Ink, blood, and other dark liquids were used by the Egyptians. Bowls of water were used by Nostradamus. In Deuteronomy, God says, There shall not be found among you anyone who uses divination or who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. Nostradamus, by his own admission, seemed to know that his practices were condemned. The Nostradamus Encyclopedia says, quote, he, Nostradamus, indicates how it is possible for the diviner to open the mind to divine inspiration. 
Almost in the same breath, however, he beseeches his infant son never to dabble in such practices, for, he says, they desecrate the body, disturb the mind, and send the soul to perdition. Edgar Casey believed, came to believe, well, he was a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher at one point. Uh, he got into this through hypnosis. Uh, he had a throat ailment and was healed of it by a hypnotist. And then he began to put himself under self-hypnosis. And then he began to get these uh, uh, visions in that state. He was in an altered state of consciousness. Uh, and he got his information, he said, from the information. That was what he called it, the information. This was not God telling him this. Uh, well, he would put his hand over the third eye uh, and go into this trance, and they would bring uh, names and, of people and addresses and so forth, and he would say, yes, I see the body. And now he could even describe this person miles away. So that was very impressive. But one day when he came out, of his trance, they told him that he had been talking about someone who had been reincarnated. Uh, well, he hadn't believed in reincarnation. In fact, it's not biblical. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. But he abandoned what the Bible said because this information that he was getting in this altered state said reincarnation was a true event, okay? Casey would go on to teach the reincarnation of biblical characters, including Jesus himself. He taught that Jesus was the reincarnation of Joshua in Shiloh, Joseph in the court of Pharaoh, Melchizedek as he blessed Abraham, Enoch as he warned the people, and Adam as he listened to Eve. Casey taught that Christ is not a man, though the Bible says that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus and warns that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Bo Casey author John Van Auken tells us that obviously Casey's perspective on Jesus Christ is much different from the churches. When he set aside his outer self and lifted his deeper mind into the universal consciousness, a new perspective on Jesus Christ came through him to us. The Apostle Paul warned, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, you might well bear with him. There are, I think, seven marks of a false prophet in the Bible. Deuteronomy 13, you have the first one. Uh, it says if a, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams uh, gives you a sign and it comes to pass. So, even a false prophet can say things that happen, uh, but he leads you astray after other gods. That's the number one mark. What he says does not measure up to the Bible. What he says does not lead you to the true God uh, of prophecy. <laughs> In in correlation with all of the other prophecies, but it leads you after another God, okay? Number one, no matter how impressive it may be. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So that's the first criteria. And Nostradamus never led anybody to the true God. Edgar Casey claimed to be a Christian, and he was led astray by his information, was led away from the true God, away from the Bible. So again, no matter how impressive he was, uh, he led you astray after other gods. The second criteria for a, a false prophet, Deuteronomy 18, he says something, anything that doesn't come to pass, he is not a prophet of God, okay? This is what the Bible says, and it's logical. You may say in your heart, 
How will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Nostradamus and Edgar Cayce were not always vague. Among many failed prophecies was the Nostradamus prediction that a great king of terror would appear in the sky in 1999. The Nostradamus faithful taught that this would mark the beginning of World War III and the appearance of Antichrist. While interpretations of this prophecy vary, it is today clear that no such event took place. Pro-Nostradamus author Erica Cheatham actually admits that Nostradamus' powers, quote, certainly sometimes let him down in the prophecies. Meanwhile, Edgar Cayce prophesied that the lost city of Atlantis would rise from the ocean in 1968 or 1969. He also prophesied that by 1998, Los Angeles and San Francisco would be destroyed by earthquakes, while much of Japan would be submerged in water. Despite such overwhelming failures, many researchers continue to insist that because such prophets seem partly accurate, their prophecies should be considered. But if their vision does not come from God, as the evidence proves, then where does it come from? I had a friend uh, years ago uh, who was supposedly the world's or one of the world's leading experts on Nostradamus. He used to talk about it a bit, and he wrote books about it. He never convinced me of uh, any valid prophecies in Nostradamus, but let's just say that there were some, because they're ambiguous. But let's say that there were some. How could he be half right? He would have to be inspired not by God, because God isn't half right. And he didn't even claim, you know, this is not God, this is some visions or whatever that he's getting from some source. But he is not in line with the prophets of God. He's not in agreement with the prophets of God. He's not bringing anybody to God. So his source would have to be something else. I believe that Satan can make predictions only if his agents fulfill them. So he can predict disasters and so forth and, and make them happen. I mean, Satan can do things in the book of Job. Uh, he sent a wind that knocked a house down. And he had such control over it that he spared always. He stirred up the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans to come and, you know, and capture Job's flocks and kill his servants. Always one was left uh, to come and tell Job. So he has apparently some power if God allows him to do that. And uh, so Satan could do some things that would seem supernatural. And he probably has a, an IQ of several trillion, I don't know, uh, better computers than we have. He probably doesn't need computers. So he could extrapolate and, you know, and you know, figure out what things might happen. So you could get some accuracy, but not 100 percent. I mean, not even close to it. Uh, so the very fact that it's not 100 percent proves this is not from God. But false prophecy is not limited to cults and New Age adherents. It seems to have an accepted place in certain churches. Rick Joyner, a self-professed prophet who has written books about his repeated visions of Jesus Christ, countless angels, the armies of hell, and the devil himself, actually contends against the warning in Deuteronomy. He writes, One of the greatest hazards affecting maturing prophets is the erroneous interpretation of the Old Testament exhortation that if a prophet ever predicted something which did not come to pass, he was no longer to be considered a true prophet. Joyner's defense for false prophecy is that no one could step out in the faith required to walk in his calling if he knew that a single mistake would ruin him for life. He supports the notion that the general level of prophetic revelation in the church was about 65% accurate. Some are only about 10% accurate. A very few of the most mature prophets are approaching 85 to 95% accuracy. Prophecy is increasing in purity, 
but there is still a long way to go. This is actually grace for the church now because 100% accuracy in this ministry will bring a level of accountability to the church which she is too immature to bear at this time. Nowhere in the Bible are God's prophets trained in such a manner. The prophet Samuel was called by God as a boy, but the scripture tells us that Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. God's warning seems clear. The prophet that shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken falsehood and seen a lie, therefore, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord. My hand will be against the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Traveling away from the prophets that God says shall not profit this people at all. We press on to the true prophecies of God. As Daniel declared, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and makes known what shall be in the latter days. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John received a vision of the end of the world. Jesus said to him, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. He said, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. And so John begins his book, saying, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Certainly the book of Revelation is the premier source of information about the last days. In the midst of many visions, John witnessed something that has intrigued Bible scholars for centuries, a one-world empire that would come to power in the last days, an empire ultimately ruled by one man. I think the, the clearest evidence in the Bible, uh, probably the books Revelation and Daniel speak to it most specifically, but I think Revelation 13 uh, is indisputable as far as every nation, kindred, and tongue worshiping the beast, nobody uh, being able to buy or sell. He causes awe, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the bond. John describes a mysterious figure called the Beast, a man who will be the one world ruler. We find in the book of Daniel that his empire will, will, will rule the world. And we also find that in the book of Revelation, that, that every nation, kindred and tongue is subject to him and nobody can buy or sell without his mark. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This beast is supported by a second beast known as the false prophet who compels all the world to worship the beast. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and enslaved, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell except he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is 600, three score, and six. That passage describes a global government, absolute dictatorship, a global economy, no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark, and a, and a global coercion that, that is made possible. So if you have everybody, and that covers everybody, and, and God went to great lengths to say, rich and poor, free and bond, you know, uh, and so forth, uh, to make us understand that this was a worldwide unification in every nation, kindred, and tongue. 
But this one world empire had been witnessed centuries earlier by the prophet Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of ancient Babylon, was given a dream of a great image. God sent Daniel to interpret the dream and revealed that the figure represented four world empires that would come to power. Daniel is a remarkable book. Uh, it has a lot to say about the last days. Uh, truthfully, I find much of what Daniel says very difficult. Not in the category of Nostradamus, because it's saying something very definite, but I find it difficult to understand exactly what it's saying. Now, much of what it says is very clear, uh, even in its symbology. Uh, for example, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. When Daniel interpreted the dream, he said, You, O king, saw, and behold, a great image. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. You saw till a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel went on to explain the vision, saying, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof. He revealed that the first kingdom was Babylon itself, under Nebuchadnezzar. He said, You, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. Daniel went on to describe the future empire, saying, And after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and another third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things. So it is that this fourth empire is to subdue all the earth. But Daniel continued saying, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. The great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation of it sure. In time, Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up in pride, and God humbled him by giving him the heart of a beast and driving him from his kingdom. When seven years had passed, Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson and was restored. After him came his son, Belshazzar, who held a great feast. In his folly, King Belshazzar brought out the sacred vessels of the God of Israel and drank wine from them while praising other gods. The Bible says that in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote upon the wall of the king's palace. The king was terrified and called for his astrologers and wise men to read the strange writing, but none could do so. So the queen suggested he send for the prophet Daniel. When Daniel arrived, he said, O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold. And the God, in whose hand your breath is, you have not glorified. Then Daniel said, This is the interpretation of the thing. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That night, Belshazzar was slain, and so it was that the second kingdom, represented by the chest and two arms of silver, was the Medo-Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great, who conquered Babylon in 539 BC. God had even named Cyrus about two centuries before his birth in the book of Isaiah. God says of him, Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, 
thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. In fulfillment of God's prophecy, Cyrus was responsible for the return of the Jews to Jerusalem and for the rebuilding of the temple. His kingdom continued for nearly 200 years until the coming of Alexander the Great, the king of Greece, the third empire symbolized by the belly and thighs of brass. Alexander defeated the kings of Medea and Persia, an event specifically prophesied by Daniel, who was given a vision of a he-goat and a ram with two horns. The prophecy says that the goat smote the ram and broke his two horns, and then tells us specifically, the ram which you saw having two horns, these are the kings of Medea and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Greece. Alexander himself was prophesied by Daniel, called the Great Horn of the He-Goat, telling us that this Great Horn is the first king of the Greek Empire. The scripture says the goat became very great, but at the height of his power the Great Horn was broken, and for it came up four notable horns toward the four winds of heaven. In fulfillment of God's prophecy, when the Greek Empire had conquered most of the civilized world, Alexander, the Great Horn, at the height of his power, was broken off and died suddenly of a fever at the young age of 33. The four notable horns that came up afterward were Alexander's four generals who divided the kingdom amongst themselves. Daniel went on to prophesy that Alexander's kingdom would be broken and be divided, though not to his own descendants, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and given to others besides them. After Alexander's death, we read Philip, his half-brother, Alexander II, his legitimate son, and Hercules, his illegitimate son, were all three murdered, and Alexander's four generals took over. Daniel's prophecies are so specific, even foretelling the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, who would ruthlessly persecute the Jews in the second century BC, that critics have attempted to argue that Daniel must have been written after the events described. But Daniel's authorship was not questioned until about the third century AD, nearly 900 years after it was written. The first to object was the Greek philosopher and historian Porphyry. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that Porphyry was well known as a violent opponent of Christianity and defender of paganism. In defense of Daniel, the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the first century AD, confirms Daniel's authorship and chronicles how Alexander the Great encountered the book of Daniel. He writes, quote, when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended. Originally in Hebrew, the book of Daniel was translated into Greek prior to 270 B.C. in a document known as the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This confirms the writing of Daniel well before a number of the prophecies, including that of Antiochus Epiphanes, occurred. The Septuagint itself is an often debated work, but its history is confirmed by Josephus, who gives a detailed account of how its translation came about in the 3rd century B.C. The book of Ezekiel, written in the 6th century B.C., also makes mention of Daniel, as did Jesus himself, who said specifically, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whosoever reads, let him understand. Meanwhile, the arguments against the date of Daniel's writing consist only of unbelieving objections rather than historical evidence. The dominance of the Third Empire continued until about 169 B.C. when the Greeks lost control of ancient Macedon to the fourth kingdom of Daniel's prophecy. The history of Rome's origin is cloaked in mystery. According to legend, the city was founded by the twins Romulus and Remus in 753 BC. The twins were the illegitimate sons of Mars, the god of war, who raped a vestal virgin while she slept. 
When the twins were outcast, they were suckled by a she-wolf, an event commemorated in many Roman images. Another version of the story tells of a shepherd finding them and taking them to his wife, a former prostitute. Part of the mystery of these accounts comes from the use of the word looper, which in Latin means both she-wolf and prostitute, or harlot. In time, the twins would found the city of Rome, named after Romulus, who would murder his brother Remus in a quarrel and become Rome's first king. After a long reign, Romulus vanished into a thunderstorm and supposedly became a god. Later, he reappeared and, descending from the sky, declared to those who listened that, quote, it is the will of heaven that Rome be the capital of the world. Centuries later, when Rome went from being a republic to a world empire, it was said of her first emperor, Augustus, that he subjected the whole wide earth to the rule of the Roman people. Though mightiest of the four, God's prophecy makes it clear that this fourth kingdom would be divided, a division symbolized by the feet, part of iron and part of clay. Yet some scholars find an earlier division in the two legs of iron. The Roman is depicted by the two legs of this image. And the Roman Empire was indeed split in two, just as that uh, image foretold. The eastern leg of the old Roman Empire, in other words, up till recently, you know, all, a lot of the prophecy buffs have been looking at the old Roman Empire and looked at Europe and drew this nice little circle around Europe and said, well, you know, it's going to come from one of these countries. Well, what most people forget is that Rome had an eastern leg, and that was the, the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, until it fell, I think, 14-something or other to, to the Turks and became Istanbul. Uh, it was split in two in 1054 A.D., when the Pope in Rome excommunicated Michael Serularius, the Patriarch of, of Constantinople, and it was split between Roman Catholicism in the West, Eastern Orthodoxy, Greek and Russian and so forth Orthodoxy in the East. So it was split religiously uh, at that time. It had already been split in 330 AD when Constantine moved his headquarters to Constantinople. You had this whole thriving civilization for, you know, over a thousand years that was the Eastern Empire and didn't break down really until, you know, the Muslims finally took it over. So important is the understanding of the four world empires that God showed Daniel another vision of these kingdoms, symbolized by four great beasts. The four beasts parallel the four dimensions of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. All four beasts are history. There have been four world empires, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman. While most researchers agree that the first three beasts have come, it is this fourth beast that has yet to reach its complete fulfillment. Of the vision, Daniel wrote, Behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And there came up among them another little horn. In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came. Then the angel who stood by said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth, and shall devour the whole earth. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. The ten kings are also represented by the ten toes of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel prophesied that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So we know that the millennial kingdom of Christ can only occur at, when, at a time when there are ten kings ruling the world. This revived Roman Empire will come under ten heads. Now, I never believed they were the ten nations of Western Europe because the Roman Empire itself was much larger than Western Europe. It went all down through Syria and, you know, Turkey and Syria and, and Lebanon and, and all across North Africa and so forth. Uh, so it will be, the world will be divided into ten regions under ten local heads, 
and already for computer reasons, for banking reasons, the world has been divided. The Club of Rome divided the world 25 years ago into 10 regions, and that's pretty much the way it's laid out, out today. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom. So if the rabbis had known that one prophecy, if the disciples of John the Baptist had known that one prophecy, it would have solved a lot of problems for them because John the Baptist sent two disciples, you remember, from prison. He said to Jesus, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another. Hey, Lord, I ought to at least be prime minister. I introduced you to Israel. And if you're going to take the throne of, of, of your father David, how, how, how come I'm about to get my head cut off? It doesn't make sense. They thought the kingdom would be established then. No, no, no. It will only be established when those ten kings, in the days of those ten kings. These ten kings were also witnessed by the Apostle John, who saw a vision of a beast with seven heads and ten horns. The angel said to him, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So the world is to be ruled by ten men who will ultimately give their power to one man, the little horn of Daniel's vision, the mysterious figure known as the man of sin and son of perdition, Antichrist. There's some people who say, well, the Antichrist will be somebody from the past like Hitler or Genghis Khan or, you know, who knows what, uh, resurrected. No. Satan cannot resurrect anybody. He does not have that power. It says he has a deadly wound. See, people talk about, this is, the fourth beast represents the Antichrist and the revived Roman Empire. Then it says, I saw one of his heads. He's got uh, seven heads. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wanted after the beast. So this is not a resurrection. The, the beast has never been killed. You can read your history. I don't know much about history, but I, I read a little bit of history, and I can tell you, I mean, you know, that all down through history, all the great families in Europe, I mean, they've all dreamed of the revival of the Roman Empire. This empire has never been dead. It was wounded, as it were, to death, but the deadly wound was healed. This is a healing, not a resurrection. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon who gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The Bible says that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Scholars believe this worship denotes a one-world religion focused on both the dragon, whom the Bible calls Satan, and the beast, or Antichrist. This apostate church, as some have called it, is symbolized by yet another figure in John's revelation. The angel said to him, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot that sits upon many waters. So he carried me away, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I mean, this is incredible. This is the fourth time this beast has been seen in the Bible. Never did it have a woman on his back before. We never hear uh, an expression of surprise or astonishment from anybody. But now he says, when I saw her, <laughs> I wondered with great admiration. It's not, it's, he doesn't admire her. He's astonished. Uh, a woman rides the beast, and not like in a rodeo, this critter isn't trying to buck her off. She's apparently in control. A woman? On a beast? And this horrible world-devouring creature? And a woman is riding on it, apparently directing it. And I think the Bible makes it very clear who that well, it is. Well, he gives us all the identifying characteristics here. 
While the specific identity of the harlot is a matter of great debate, for now it can be said that most scholars agree she represents a world religious system and is called a harlot because of her unfaithfulness to God. It is believed this religious system somehow controls or manipulates the coming one world government, symbolized by the fact that the woman rides the beast. There are signs the world is speedily coming to an end. These words are attributed to an Assyrian clay tablet dated 2800 BC. It seems that men have believed the end is near in almost every generation. Pope Innocent III pronounced the second coming of Christ in the year 1284 AD because this date was supposedly 666 years after the founding of Islam. There have been many such predictions that have often compelled men to extreme behavior. In 1669, a cult in Russia known as the Old Believers began setting themselves on fire to protect themselves from Antichrist. It is reported that by 1690, 20,000 people had perished as a result. In the 19th century, a second Adventist named William Miller convinced thousands that the world would end in 1843. But when that date came and went, Miller recalculated and claimed the date was really October 22nd of the following year. Charles Taze Russell, the claimed founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, was convinced by Nelson Barber that Jesus Christ had returned in 1874, but that his return had been invisible. Russell went on to promote this teaching, saying, quote, The millennium began in 1874 with the return of Christ. Russell would later revise his view, and since then the Jehovah's Witnesses have predicted the world would end in 1914, 1918, 1925, 1941, and 1975. But as contrary as they seem, even these things are the fulfillment of God's prophecies. Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, and shall deceive many. False prophets shall rise, he said. Behold, I have told you before. The Lord said that of that day and hour knows no man. Some have taken this to mean that Christians need not pay attention to Bible prophecy. But Jesus also said, Watch therefore, because you do not know what hour your Lord will come. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch. Considering these things, what is it about this time on earth that sets it apart from all those centuries that have come before us? Any time uh, prior to the 20th century, uh, the 666 and, and any other date that has actually been predicted uh, would have been an impossibility as far as what the biblical parameters were in the model that Jesus set forth to uh, show forth uh, the end of the world in Armageddon. And we know that because the Bible told us that Israel uh, would have to become a nation again. We know that Israel would have to become a nation again based on several different prophecies. I mean, and the most significant um, prophecy, I think, has to do with the restoration of Israel to its land, which happened in 1948. Right after World War II, you had this great influx of, of Jews of, of, who became later Israelis into the ancient homeland of Israel after 2,000 years of diaspora. 2,000 years, almost. You've got these people coming from all over the world into Israel in 1948. Now, 48 was when they became a homeland, but prior to that, they were all there. From, from the end of the war, from 45 on, you know, they were there, and um, we all know what happens. You know, they, the British pull out, and, you know, a nation becomes a nation in a day. It's kind of bizarre after 2,000 years. Some have considered that certain prophecies concerning the return of the Jews to the Promised Land may have been fulfilled when they returned from their ancient captivity in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Yet centuries after this return, Jesus prophesied that they would be scattered again in fulfillment of further prophecies. Jesus foretold of the destruction of Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jews, an historic event now known as the Diaspora that would occur in 70 AD. He spoke of the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. For there shall be wrath upon this people, he said, 
and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When he brought them into the land, he warned them if they disobeyed his voice, he would cast them out, not just next door. He would scatter them to every nation on the face of this earth. You'll find that in Amos 9.9. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. I mean, all through the Bible, over and over and over, God said he would scatter them, he would sift them like wheat among all the nations of the earth. And it happened. We call them the wandering Jew. You find them everywhere. Uh, and God said that during their dispersion, they would be hated, persecuted, killed, m mocked, uh, like no other people on the face of this earth. Anti-Semitism is laid out in detail. In the Old Testament, God said to the children of Israel, It shall come to pass, if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, that all these curses shall come upon you. The Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies, and you shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And you shall be left few in number, whereas you are numerous as the stars of heaven, because you would not obey the Lord your God. And the Lord shall scatter you among all people, from the one end of the earth to the other. And among these nations you will find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot find rest. But the Lord shall give you there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day, and shall have no assurance of your life, and no man shall save you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given unto another people, while your eyes look on and yearn for them. But there will be nothing you can do. And you will never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually, so that you will be driven mad by the sight of what you see. And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb and a byword among all nations to which the Lord shall lead you. And there is no people ever in history that has been marked in that way, like the Jews. I mean, that, that in itself would be enough to tell you that the Bible is true. God said they would be hated and persecuted and killed, but he would not let them be destroyed. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. And why do I believe that the Jews are being, recur being encouraged to return to their land? Because God foretold that he would bring them all back. He said at the end of the age in Old Testament prophecies that they would not, that he would, he would bring them back as, you know, back to the land. And that once they were back to the land, they would never more be thrown out of it. And I will bring back my exiled people, Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So if you, if you see Israel destroyed and annihilated, well, then we can throw away our Bibles and, and find, find another, another religion to believe in. Because God said absolutely clearly he would not allow them to be defeated. The nation Israel, Israel will not cease to exist as a nation forever, God says in Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 35. And he says, if they cease, then there's no sun in the sky. There's no moon. There's no stars. The tides don't work. This universe is finished. That's how important Israel is. If you believe in, in the prophetic time clock, and I do, I believe that, that the only way you can look, we as Christians can, can factor anything in at all, is you've got to look at Israel. Israel's the key. Israel is the key. The prophecies hinge around Israel. Israel is the key to all end time events. And, and, and we show that, you know, that, um, that uh, the, 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 the actual clock ticking down toward the, you know, toward the end of the age, could not begin until Israel had returned back to our land. So if I lived 200 years ago, and you said, Lynn, when's Jesus going to come back? And I would say, I don't know. He's going to come back. But I don't, think we're in the, I don't think we're in the window of time where that's going to happen.
also Israel had to be a nation for Armageddon to take place because in Zechariah 14 we see in 12 through 14 we see all the nations surrounding Israel if Israel doesn't exist you can't have all nations surrounding them to destroy them the word Armageddon has become a general term for destruction calamity and the end of the world as represented by various artists filmmakers and authors yet its biblical meaning is more specific according to the Bible Armageddon is what happens when all the nations of the earth are gathered together against Jerusalem and the Jews. God declared that in the last days he would make Jerusalem a cup of trembling for all the nations of the earth. Zechariah chapter 12 tells us that they'd be a burdensome stone, that if anybody sought to lift that stone they'd be injured. Uh, we see that the whole world is looking at Israel as a burdensome stone that's keeping the world from this world peace. God said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone in the last days for all the nations of the world. When they're in their siege against Jerusalem, and there is a siege against Jerusalem today. I mean, you can't believe it. Well, a cup of trembling. I mean, what a stupid remark. I mean, that, you know, what, what's that about? I mean, it, what, a, what a ridiculous statement to make. You know, and scoffers of the Bible have pointed to that and go, please, Jerusalem, a cup of trembling of the whole world? Let's take it literally. Let's look at that 500 years ago. Let's look at it during the Crusades a thousand years ago. Not to the whole world, it wasn't a cup of trembling, was it? Not to the whole world in a, in a literal sense. And I'm, I'm a literalist, unfortunately. But when it says the whole world, Jerusalem today is a cup of trembling to the whole world. The United Nations has condemned Israel more than 370 times. They never condemned the Arabs for attacking them. They condemned the Jews for defending themselves. I mean, it's incredible. The whole world is against them. Uh, and God said, I'll make them a cup of trembling. And this is the number one problem that the United Nations faces today. Everybody knows it. The United Nations has spent one third of its time in deliberations and pronouncements about Jerusalem and Israel. This little land that has one one-thousandth of the world's population. They spend a third of their time on it. Talking, they're, everyone's afraid of, you know, what happens if, you know, this powder cake starts off in the Middle East, we may be looking at World War III. It has become a cup of trembling to the whole world. God foretold of the siege both against Judah, the Jews, and against Jerusalem. Then he goes on to speak of the day of the Lord, saying, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. God makes it clear that what he does with Israel is to be a witness to all the nations of the earth. In fact, in Isaiah 43.10, God says to uh, Israel, You are my witnesses to yourselves and to the world that I am God. Not because we've got... Uh, a lot of godly Jewish people running around the world telling people that God exists. They don't do that. But because of what the Bible said would happen to them, and it has happened. I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. The nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Some might find it hard to believe that all the world would be against the Jews, since Israel seems to have many allies. Some have even believed that the Jews secretly control the world behind the scenes, manipulating media and world government. But God said of Israel under the curse of the law that there would be no might in their hand and that Israel would be only oppressed and crushed always because of their disobedience. Can it be that in a mere half century since the rebirth of Israel as a nation, that the Jews have overthrown all the ancient institutions of the world? Such allegations of a Jewish conspiracy were also propagated by Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party prior to the Holocaust. But this conspiracy for Israel's destruction is clearly mentioned in the Bible. The psalmist writes, Keep not silence, O God, for lo, your enemies have taken crafty counsel against your people. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. They have consulted together with one consent. 
The psalmist then names the Arab nations of the ancient world, including the Philistines, from where we get the name Palestinian. Is it any wonder that the leader of the modern Palestine Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, has openly declared, quote, peace for us means the destruction of Israel and nothing else. But this desire is not confined to the Arabs, despite outward appearances. In 1994, John Loftus and Mark Ahrens, two secular authors, published their best-selling controversial work, The Secret War Against the Jews. Based upon 12 years of research, having interviewed more than 500 former officers of the intelligence community, the opening line of the introduction reads, quote, the major powers of the world have repeatedly planned covert operations to bring about the partial or total destruction of Israel. Meanwhile, the publisher includes this review saying, quote, the authors demonstrate that numerous Western countries, especially the United States and Great Britain, have conducted repeated and willful spying missions on Palestine and later Israel over many decades. While on the surface these two countries and others profess to be ardent allies of Israel, they work in fact through their intelligence services to betray Israel's secrets to the Arabs. Their motive, oil and multinational profits which must be attained at any price. foretells that events leading to Armageddon will be a time of trouble the likes of which mankind has never before witnessed. Jesus said, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. That's an amazing prophecy. Now, you couldn't wipe out all flesh with bows and arrows and swords and spears, the weapons that they had in that day, not even with conventional bombs from World War II. But we live in a day where we have weapons so horrible. I mean, it is just beyond science fiction. You give us an address anywhere, and we'll send a bomb right through the front door from 500 miles away. Man has the power to destroy the Earth completely. Now that's never happened before. They couldn't do it with bows and arrows and horses and, and so on and so forth. In fact, the Bible says the nations will turn their weapons on each other in Zechariah 14. And it says that as they're standing, their eyeballs and their tongues will uh, be consumed and, and dissolved out of their mouths while they're on their feet. Uh, that, wasn't impossible. that was impossible with weapons that we had just 80 years ago. You couldn't have even foreseen when this prophecy, Jesus says, unless I intervene, no flesh is left. I think you've got a nuclear exchange underway or about to start, and Jesus intervenes to rescue Israel. He's not going to let them be destroyed. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. When this passage is compared with the New Testament, we find further reassurance of the second coming of Christ. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus stood upon the Mount of Olives with his disciples. Perhaps they were considering Zechariah's prophecy when they asked, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Jesus answered them saying, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Then as they beheld him, he ascended into heaven. The disciples seemed to watch in confusion, and so two men stood by in white clothing, who said to them, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The angels seemed to be reassuring the disciples that Jesus would indeed fulfill Zechariah's prophecy that even as he ascended from the Mount of Olives, he would likewise return, and his feet will stand in that day in the same place he departed. And he destroys Antichrist, because it's Antichrist. I believe it's not just Russia, in, in my opinion, uh, and the Arab uh, nations and Confederacy and so forth. Sure, they're there. 
but it's the whole world, the United States, to everybody. Uh, and uh, they're vying with one another, you know. The kings come from the east. Maybe they can take over at this time. I don't know. It gets to be a whole mess in Armageddon. And God says in, in Ezekiel 38 that he brings the nations there to judge them, to punish them for what they've done to his people Israel. He also is punishing Israel. This is the final punishment for Israel. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, is called the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will preserve, be, but he will be preserved out of it. <laughs> so God is going to punish the world and he's going to chastise his people. And then Christ will intervene or there wouldn't be anybody left on this earth. I mean, we can turn this earth into a sterile bit of dust, not even a microbe, not even a mosquito or a cockroach left. We have the weapons to do that. And that's an amazing prophecy. That's Armageddon. But how will all nations be gathered together against Jerusalem unless they are somehow united in a common cause? Bible researchers believe that cause will be the last day empire prophesied through Daniel and witnessed by the Apostle John. This empire will consist of a one world government, a one world religion, and a world economy, all united under a one world leader known in the Bible as Antichrist. And you can see it happening before your very eyes. This world church, really, uh, the ecumenical movement is going to be united with the world government. Now we also have a hierarchy of elitists um, who are steeped in the mystery religions who want power. A very modern, uh, um, a modern embodiment of that would be Hitler who brought about the Second World War because he wanted power. He was in an occult mystery religion, and he believed that the Aryan super race could take over the world. That we're heading for a world government, there's no doubt. That we're, uh, head and, and, and that everything will be controlled with a number, that you won't be able to buy or sell, and so forth. I mean, we have the computers today to do it. You couldn't have imme even imagined what that would mean 100 years ago. The Word of God says that the spirits, the, the demonic world, go forth to the kings of the world and gather them to, together for the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which in the Hebrew tongue is called Armageddon. So that these spirits had an objective, and it is to unite the world and bring the world against Christ in Armageddon. Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. So we have got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of organizations that are working, in a sense, networking with each other to bring about a religious philosophy that will ultimately usher in the Antichrist. So when the Bible talks about the man of lawlessness, a one world government, a one world religion, you can bank on it. World government has been declared by some of the greatest leaders and influential minds of the last century. The focus of their desire is supposedly world peace. Albert Einstein said, mankind's desire for peace can be realized only by the creation of a world government. Einstein also declared, quote, there is no salvation for civilization or even the human race other than the creation of a world government. Meanwhile, Nehru, the leader of India during the days of Mahatma Gandhi declared, I have long believed the only way peace can be achieved is through world government. We have arrived at a stage where the next step must comprise a world and all its states submitting to the authority of world organization. Mortimer Adler said, world peace is impossible without world government. And Sir Winston Churchill declared, the creation of an authoritative world order is the ultimate aim toward which we must strive. French President Charles de Gaulle seemed adamant when he said, nations must unite in a world government or perish. Walter Cronkite said concerning nuclear devastation that, quote, if we are to avoid that catastrophe, a system of world order, preferably a system of world government, is mandatory. The proud nation someday will see the light and for the common good and their own survival yield up their precious sovereignty 
just as America's 13 colonies did two centuries ago. In 1992, Strobe Talbot, President Clinton's Deputy Secretary of State, was quoted in Time magazine saying, In the next century, nations as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. National sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all. In December 2001, Edward Widmer, the president of the Illinois Division of the United Nations Association of the United States, said, quote, Within 10 years' time, you're going to see the beginning of an embryonic world order. Britain's Prime Minister Tony Blair said, quote, Globalization has transformed our economies and our working practices. It is a political and security phenomenon. We are all internationalists now, whether we like it or not. We are witnessing the beginnings of a new doctrine of international community. While the quote that seems to consolidate them all comes from Robert Mueller, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, who said, we must move as quickly as possible to a one-world government, a one-world religion, under a one-world leader. As to what manner of leadership is under consideration, consider this quote from Paul Henry Spack, the former Secretary General of NATO, who in 1957 said, what we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of the people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or the devil, we will receive him. Late in the 18th century, a group known as the Jacobins who brought about the French Revolution said they were seeking to establish what they called a universal republic or a new world order. That very phrase has come to represent the entire march toward world government, the coming last day empire spoken of by the highest offices in all the world. Robert Kennedy, the former U.S. Attorney General in 1967 said, all of us will ultimately be judged on the effort we have contributed to building a new world order. In October 1967, Richard Nixon was quoted in Foreign Affairs saying, the developing coherence of Asian regional thinking is to evolve regional approaches to development needs and to the evolution of a new world order. A few years later, the New York Times reported that Nixon spoke of the talks as a beginning, merely reiterating the belief he brought to China that both nations share an interest in peace and building a new world order. On July 26, 1968, the Associated Press reported that New York Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller says as president he would work toward international creation of a new world order. In 1976, a new document surfaced that was called the Declaration of Interdependence. It was signed by 32 U.S. Senators and 92 representatives in Washington, D.C. It read, in part, two centuries ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation. Now we must join with others to bring forth a new world order. And Henry Kissinger, in an address before the United Nations in 1975, said, So we say to all peoples and governments, let us fashion together a new world order. In 1994, Kissinger stated that the new world order cannot happen without U.S. participation, as we are the most significant single component. Yes, there will be a new world order, and it will force the United States to change its perceptions. This new world order goal is supposedly for the good of all mankind, as Nelson Mandela affirmed in the Philadelphia Inquirer in October of 1994 when he said, the new world order that is in the making must focus on the creation of a world of democracy, peace and prosperity for all. Democratic leader Richard Gephardt in the Wall Street Journal said, we can see beyond the present shadows of war in the Middle East to a new world order where the strong work together to deter and stop aggression. This was precisely Franklin Roosevelt's and Winston Churchill's vision for peace for the post-war period. 
Even President Mubarak of Egypt is quoted in the New York Times saying that the renewal of the non-proliferation treaty was described as important, quote, for the welfare of the whole world and the new world order. Also before the United Nations in 1979, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro said, we must establish a new world order based on justice, on equity, and on peace. Mikhail Gorbachev, the former leader of the Soviet Union, made this rather disturbing association when he said, we are moving toward a new world order, the world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. Perhaps most troubling of all is this quote from Adolf Hitler during the Second World War who said, National Socialism will use its own revolution for the establishing of a new world order. Such disturbing statements about the New World Order are not confined to Hitler. Historian Walter Mills, writing about World War I, described the efforts of Colonel Mandel House, the chief advisor to President Wilson, speaking of his hidden motive for involving America in the war. He wrote, the colonel's sole justification for preparing such a batch of blood for his countrymen was his hope of establishing a new world order of peace and security. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, for while they are saying peace and security, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. The labor pains or birth pangs a woman suffers during childbirth come suddenly, but not all at once. The contractions are usually spread apart at first and can continue for many hours. But as the labor reaches its climax, the contractions quicken until they come one right after another. This is the picture given in the Bible of how catastrophic events will progress as the day of the Lord approaches. The starting gun for these contractions seems to be the cry of peace and security, as we saw with Colonel House and the First World War. In fact, during World War I, Nicholas Murray Butler, who ironically would win the Nobel Prize for Peace, gave this mysterious address before the Union League of Philadelphia on November 27, 1915. He said, The old world order died with the setting of that day's sun and a new world order is being born while I speak, with birth pangs so terrible that it seems almost incredible that life could come out of such fearful suffering and such overwhelming sorrow. An estimated 16 million lives were lost during World War I. But the conflict to come would make the Great War pale by comparison. While the numbers vary, it is now estimated that some 50 million lives were lost as a result of World War II, a birth pang which began with a similar declaration of peace for the sake of security. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain met with Adolf Hitler in 1938 to draft the Munich Accord for the purpose of supposedly providing security for Czechoslovakia and to assure the peace of Europe. Chamberlain arrived back in London with this historic announcement. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples 
never to go to war with one another again. I believe it is peace for our time, he said. Go home and get a nice quiet sleep. So confident were the British, they posted signs saying, Don't mind Hitler, take your holiday. Six months later, Hitler violated the agreement when the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia. In less than a year, World War II was officially underway. Chamberlain's declaration of peace is today considered one of the greatest blunders of the 20th century. Can these events have been a foreshadowing of things to come? You be the judge as you consider this speech given by President George Bush Sr. when he spoke of the New World Order before the United States Congress in 1991. A new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Peace and security, peace and security, freedom, and the rule of law. Some find it interesting that President Bush made this declaration on September the 11th, 1991, exactly 10 years prior to the destructive attack on America. But Bush had spoken of the New World Order a year before. Concerning the crisis in the Persian Gulf, he said, out of these troubled times, a new world order can emerge. These words he spoke on September the 11th, 1990, 11 years prior to America's tragedy. Can all these things be merely coincidence? And why would world government and a desire for peace and security bring about destruction? Jesus said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Can it be that the world peace pursued by kings and rulers is somehow contrary to the peace of Christ? James Warburg of the Council on Foreign Relations, while speaking to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on February 17, 1950, said, We shall have world government whether or not we like it. The question is only whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. An early warning against the tone of this movement was sounded by Congressman Larry P. McDonald, who even named some of those he deemed responsible, when he said, the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one-world government, combining super-capitalism and communism under the same tent, all under their control. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I am convinced there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning, and incredibly evil in intent. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., in the July-August 1995 issue of Foreign Affairs said, we are not going to achieve a new world order without paying for it in blood as well as words and money. Decades earlier, famed author H.G. Wells, who wrote such works as The Time Machine and The Invisible Man, was also a member of a controversial group known as the Fabian Socialist Society. While his science fiction books are well known, Wells also wrote a little-known work titled The New World Order, published in 1939. In it, he states, countless people will hate the New World Order and will die protesting against it. When we attempt to evaluate its promise, we have to bear in mind the distress of a generation or so of malcontents, many of them quite gallant and graceful-looking people. So affected was he by his research on the subject that author Ralph Epperson compared the New World Order to George Orwell's 1984. He said, it might have been George Orwell in his book, 1984, that best summarized what the New World Order had in store for the world when he wrote, If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Thankfully, the Bible tells us that the tribulation brought about by this New World Order empire will not last forever but the Lord himself will intervene on behalf of those who put faith in him. But before that hour comes, Jesus said that the world would suffer affliction worse than any it has ever before seen.
Jesus said that everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Many believe that the drive for a new world order is a secret operation and that those who are aware of its true intent know full well that what they are planning is a kingdom of evil. Seven days before his tragic assassination, President John F. Kennedy is alleged to have said, there exists in this country a plot to enslave every man, woman, and child. Before I leave this high and noble office, I intend to expose this plot. But Kennedy was not the first to speak of such things. John F. Hyland, the mayor of New York from 1918 to 1925 said, the real menace of our republic is the invisible government, which like a giant octopus, sprawls its slimy length over our city, state, and nation. World War II General Douglas MacArthur said, I am concerned for the security of our great nation, not so much because of any threat from without, but because of the insidious forces working from within. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter is quoted saying, the real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise their power from behind the scenes. Even President Woodrow Wilson supported such claims. Today, the White House website reports that Wilson, quote, asserted international leadership in building a new world order. However, in 1913, Wilson wrote these words in a work titled, The New Freedom. He said, some of the biggest men in the United States are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. But is this secret power only at work in America? A century earlier, English Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli wrote, the world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. Disraeli warned of a worldwide conspiracy in 1876 when he said, the governments of the present day have to deal not merely with other governments, with emperors, kings, and ministers, but also with the secret societies, which have everywhere their unscrupulous agents and can, at the last moment, upset all the government's plans. In 1920, the Christian Science Monitor wrote that, what is important is the increasing evidence of the existence of a secret conspiracy throughout the world for the destruction of organized government and the letting loose of evil. While much has been written and said about various conspiracy theories, the Bible makes it clear that the world conspiracy is ultimately against God himself. King David wrote, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? Their kings revolt, their rulers plot together against the Lord and against the king he chose. Most researchers who investigate the New World Order at some point trace the movement back to Bavaria in the 18th century to a man named Adam Weishaupt, a professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt, a school of the Roman Catholic Jesuit order. Some claim that Weishaupt himself was a Jesuit. Others say that he was not. Nevertheless, the influence of this powerful order is not to be overlooked. From their beginning with founder Ignatius Loyola in the 16th century, the Jesuits were a subversive organization known for their lust for power, because of which they were suppressed by popes and banished by kings no less than 30 times from the nations of Europe. So nefarious were they that the Marquis de Lafayette in 1799 said of them, it is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars of Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, while lamenting his exile on St. Helena, said, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. And the aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world, 
by the volition of a single man. Even President John Adams wrote these shocking words in a letter to Thomas Jefferson. Of the Jesuits, he said, if ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. It was among such men that Adam Weishaupt gained the skills that would one day earn him the credit of being called the profoundest conspirator that has ever existed. Weishaupt had his own lust for power and formed a secret society whose plan was to revolt against all established authority on earth. He codenamed himself Spartacus and called his society the Illuminati. The name Spartacus pertains to the ancient gladiator who rebelled against the tyranny of Rome, while the name Illuminati pertains to the greatest rebel of all time. Author Myron Fagan writes that Weisopt himself said that the word Illuminati is derived from Lucifer and means holders of the light. The Illuminati is so called because they are the illumined ones. And they are illumined through, uh, according to their own definition of the term, they are illumined by an understanding of the occult sciences, of the satanic sciences, uh, of the mysteries religion. They are illuminated. They are, they, they are not illumined according to, 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 to scripture. Oh no. They are illumined according to occult doctrine, occult understanding, and occult power. And much of their occult power comes through an interaction with guiding spirits which the Bible calls demons. For they are the spirits of demons that go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. We read that Weisot began to write out the master plan that was designed to give the synagogue of Satan, so named by Jesus Christ, ultimate world domination, so they could impose the Luciferian ideology on the human race. But in order for Weisopt to bring forth his new order, he needed to somehow destroy the old order. The method he chose was to bring about a world revolution. Professor John Robeson, who exposed the Illuminati in his work titled Proofs of a Conspiracy, published in 1798, wrote, the true purpose of the order was to rule the world. To achieve this, it was necessary for the order to destroy all religions, overthrow all governments, and abolish private property. Because the average man would not openly follow a satanic plan, the agenda of the Illuminati was to be concealed through secret societies, some of which traced themselves back thousands of years. It was these same powers that Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli warned were contending against the governments of the world. This plan that goes back hundreds if not thousands of years um, tends to be kept in the bowels of these blood oath secret societies. And by that I mean the Shriners, the Freemasons, the Odd Fellows, uh, the Illuminati, the Order of the Palladium. They, there are literally dozens of names down throughout the centuries that this goes by. But, it has to be in one of these groups where you have to swear to kill a fellow member of the society if they reveal the secrets, or you yourself be killed by a member of the society if you reveal the secrets. That's what blood oaths are. And they start out bad, but they get worse as you go up in the organization. Now, not all of them take it all that seriously. Uh, you know, some of them just do it because, as I was promised when I was 21, you become a Mason, uh, your financial fortunes are guaranteed for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, I, I bolted. I said, no, I'm not, you know, I don't think Christ would approve of this. Weisop saw in the ancient orders of Freemasonry an opportunity to commission foot soldiers for his cause of world domination. He wrote that none is fitter than the three lower degrees of Freemasonry. The public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. Weishaupt felt that masonry was the easiest way to get a good Christian guy uh, on the path of destruction, essentially, uh, where you can, you can have him take little baby steps on this path. It's a system they've been working on for thousands of years. They've really got it down. They know how to gradually, gently corrupt people from Christendom, uh, first of all, to deism, 
Uh, of course, deism is, is where, uh, yes, God started the world, but then he took off, and he has no place in the affairs of uh, men now. And so you don't have to worry about God. You don't have to worry about heaven and hell. You just kind of do your thing, and everything will be okay. Um, uh, deism to atheism is the next step. Atheism where you, you claim there is no God. You know, um, and then, of course, the next step is, is out and out Satanism. And interestingly enough, Satanists know there's God, know there's a heaven and hell, and they just choose hell. And they choose to drag as many people into hell as they can. Yes, Masons were instrumental in the founding of this country. Uh, a large percentage of the founding fathers were Masons. But that doesn't mean that uh, a large percentage of the founding fathers were evil men. You have to look at Masonry as uh, a way to get good Christians, to lure good Christians uh, gradually over to deism, to atheism, and eventually to Satanism. That's the purpose of Freemasonry. It's to lure good people into these evil roads. Why? Because if you have an evil secret society uh, where you're trying to create the Antichrist here on Earth, not many people are going to come and join up. So you have to convince them that they're doing something good for the world, gradually get them in, and little by little try to corrupt them. Weisopt gained the allegiance of low-level Masons by telling them that the Illuminati held the true sense of Christianity. Behold our secret, he said, if in order to destroy all Christianity, all religion, we have pretended to have the sole true religion, remember that the end justifies the means. Because of this, some have argued that Weisopt corrupted Freemasonry. He didn't have to corrupt Masonry. Masonry is a corruption skateboard ready-made for his purposes. Uh, it, there's, I mean, that's, there's no difference with what Weishaupt did. He just put a name to it and he got caught. That's the only difference. That whole system, the, this, um, this uh, what do you want to call it, a, a sleigh ride into hell, descent into hell, has always been in existence. It's just masonry uh, formalized it, categorized it, uh, worked on it, perfected it, and then Weishaupt came along and said, well, now how do we get, just make that, make them go a little faster? That's all he did. The religion of masonry, while often cloaked with Christian titles, is actually based upon the ancient mystery religion of Babylon and Egypt. These same mysteries govern the worship of Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The mysteries are often symbolized by the all-seeing eye, sometimes called the eye of God. But the God of Masonry is not the same as the God of the Bible. None was more adamant about this point than the man considered by many to be the most influential Mason of all time, Albert Pike. Albert Pike was a Confederate Civil War general who was the head of American Freemasonry in the post-Civil War period. His, he's, he was probably the most, he's certainly the most important American Mason. Uh, his book, Morals and Dogma, is required reading uh, for every Freemason. He says on page uh, 64, 624, the 28th degree, teachings of the 28th degree, he says, quote, Masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries. Okay, and then he goes on, he says, we produce, or we reproduce the speculations of the philosophers, the Kabbalists, the mystiques, and the Gnostics, unquote. Well, these were all, all uh, systems, religious systems, that worshipped Lucifer. Uh, Pike, uh, probably mistakenly, reveals uh, his true intent because he speaks of Lucifer frequently. When he says we are identical to all the mysteries, he, the mysteries were all brought under God's condemnation and destroyed at one point or another in history. From the Babylonian mysteries to the Egyptian mysteries to the peoples living in the, in, in the land of, of uh, Canaan. When, you know, with a major reason God destroyed them, he ordered them to be killed, man and women and child. They were all worshipping Satan. Uh, now see, Masons distinguish between Lucifer and Satan. Uh, uh, Masons believe that Lucifer is the light bearer, the good God, and that the Christian God is called Adonai, the evil God. They use as their justification that if the Christian God was a good God, 
then uh, there wouldn't be this Garden of Eden problem where because you ate of the apple, now you have to suffer and you have to s the sweat of your brow, you have to make your living, well, women have to uh, give birth in pain, etc. You know, no, no good father would do that to his children. So the Christian God is the evil God where, where uh, Lucifer is the good God because he'll give you everything you want. He'll fulfill your every desire. In 1908, French occult expert Copin Albancelli wrote, Certain Masonic societies exist which are satanic, not in the sense that the devil comes to preside at their meetings, but in that their initiates profess the cult of Lucifer. They adore him as the true God, and they are animated by an implacable hatred against the Christian God, whom they declare to be an imposter. Perhaps Albert Pike's most famous and controversial quote is this one. The true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. Because of this, occult author Edith Starr Miller wrote, Luciferian occultism controls Freemasonry. It is important to remember that the lower ranks of Masonry are largely unaware of the deception of their leaders. Master Mason Manley P. Hall, who said that when the Mason learns the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, also made it clear that Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity, an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect. Meanwhile, Albert Pike wrote in his famous Morals and Dogma that symbols are displayed to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine that he shall understand them. Jesus said, I spoke openly to the world, and in secret have I said nothing. Nevertheless, secret societies by their very nature openly reject the example of Christ. As Albancelli wrote, it is professed in these societies that all that the Christian God commands is disagreeable to Lucifer. In consequence, one must do all that the Christian God forbids, and one must shun like fire all that he commands. Even to gain entrance into these societies, a man must violate the commandment of God. For the Lord has said, Make no oath at all, either by heaven or by the earth, nor shall you make an oath by your head. But let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than these comes from the evil one. As we shall see, this rejection of God and his son Jesus Christ has been the driving force behind the world revolution and the growing tide of tribulation that has afflicted mankind for more than two centuries. While Christ said, I spoke openly to the world, Albert Pike declared that masonry conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect. According to the Masonic Cyclopedia, an adept is a name given to the order of the Illuminati. With their common interest in Lucifer, secrecy, and a desire for world domination, we read that after lengthy negotiations between Weisopt and members of Masonry, an agreement was reached on December 20th, 1781, to combine the two orders. A conscientious Mason named the Comte de Veru, who attended this secret meeting at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad in Germany, later warned in his biography, saying, All this is very much more serious than you think. The conspiracy which is being woven is so well thought out that it will be impossible for the monarchy and the church to escape it. Despite the fears of the Comte de Veru, the word of God makes it clear that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Yet we read that, according to his biographer, from that point forward, the Comte de Veru could only speak of Freemasonry with horror. In the 1920s, historian Nesta Webster wrote of this conspiracy, saying, it was by this terrible and formidable sect that the gigantic plan of world revolution was worked out, a program hitherto unprecedented in the history of civilization. Communistic theories had been held by isolated thinkers or groups of thinkers since the days of Plato, 
but no one, as far as we know, had ever yet seriously proposed to destroy everything for which civilization stands. Moreover, the plan of Illuminism has continued up to the present day. In 1784, the Illuminati were exposed by the Bavarian government, who issued an edict forbidding all secret societies. They seized documents which exposed the workings of the order and became convinced that they were planning to take over the world by way of revolution. So concerned were they, they issued an official document to the governments of Europe called the Original Writings of the Order of the Illuminati. Sadly, the powers of Europe did not take the warning or the Illuminati seriously. In 1790, the famed occultist and magician Cagliostro was arrested by the Inquisition in Rome. He told them that he had been initiated into the Illuminati in 1783 and was shown a book which stated that Illuminism was a conspiracy directed against thrones and altars and that the first blows were to attain France. The first Illuminist uh, overthrow of a nation was the French Revolution. Most of us in our world history classes were pretty much taught that the French Re Revolution was glorious and that the, the uh, French monarchy was terrible and uh, so the, the public finally rose up and broke into the Bastille and took the guns and went out and had a revolution and kicked out the monarchs. That's what we, that's what we grow up with, but that's not the fact of the matter. A group of radicals surfaced in France known as the Jacobin Clubs that were organized under the direct inspiration of the Bavarian Illuminati. In 1793, Alois Hoffmann, the editor of the Vienna Journal, wrote, I shall never cease to repeat that the French Revolution has come from Masonry and the Illuminati. The Jacobins vowed to destroy the monarchy and sought to establish what they called a new world order. The French government was the most liberal in all of Europe, was the least likely to be in need of a revolution. In 1789, an artificial shortage of grain was created by Illuminist manipulations of the grain market. This produced a famine so intense that it brought the nation to the edge of revolt. The conspirators held up the food supplies and blocked all reforms in the National Assembly to exacerbate the situation, and the populace starved. With the Jacobin propaganda, the people blamed the monarchy, King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. Antoinette is famous for having said, let them eat cake, in response to the starvation of the people. But modern research has exposed the phrase was set down earlier by philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 1766, while Marie Antoinette was only 10 years old. As one source writes, the saying was attributed to Marie Antoinette in 1789 by radical agitators who were trying to turn the populace against her. As a result of such lies and propaganda, King Louis XVI and his queen were overthrown and murdered on behalf of the revolution. King Louis seems to have been a more compassionate ruler than historians often credit him for. When the revolutionaries broke into the royal palace, his Swiss guard was slain because they were ordered not to fire upon the people. At his execution, Louis said, I pardon those who have occasioned my death, and I pray to God that the blood you are going to shed may never be visited on France. The Bible says concerning governing authorities, there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. While pretending to fight for the rights of the people, the Jacobins with their satanic agenda became more bloody and tyrannical than most monarchies have ever been. Terror was rampant in the streets of Paris. The full horror of government by Satanism was being played out, complete with human butcherings and cannibalism. During the reign of terror, approximately 18,000 citizens were sent to the guillotine, and many more died in prison without being formally brought to trial. 
Adam Weissop sent his hand-picked representative into Paris, a man named Anacharsis Klutz. Klutz arrogantly claimed to be the orator of mankind and called himself the personal enemy of Jesus Christ. He then set about to remove all traces of Christianity from France. He even abolished Sunday and attempted to create his own calendar. But perhaps the most ghastly and horrific element of the French Revolution was a program that would set a pattern for wicked governments ever after. In 1793, the revolutionary leaders embarked upon a fearful new project called depopulation. They attempted to reduce the population of France, France, which at the time was 25 million, they decided they were going to reduce that down to 16 million. Why? Because there was high unemployment as a result of the French Revolution. So their answer to unemployment was kill about 9 million people. The Jacobins toiled over maps and selected in each region the number of citizens to be murdered. In Nantes, 500 children were killed in one butchery, and 144 poor women who sewed shirts for the army were thrown into the river. Stone quarries were a favorite site for mass extermination, and it was said that many quarry operators had to shut down due to the piles of bodies. While the depopulation program failed to achieve its goal of slaughtering 9 to 17 million people, the death toll taken at the time records about 300,000 murdered. More than a century later, Adolf Hitler would refer to his Nazi movement as the exact counterpart of the French Revolution. Dr. Brzezinski, the former national security advisor in 1993, estimated that in the 20th century, 167 to 175 million lives were deliberately extinguished by politically motivated carnage. Many have come to believe that such carnage began with the Jacobin depopulation program. In time, the Jacobins desired to foment a second revolution in America. But they wanted to bring the French Revolution over to America, which was after the American Revolution. But the American Revolution didn't turn out the way the French Revolution did. Uh, Christianity remained very strong and a strong part of the new American government, where uh, religion was eliminated in France by the French Revolution. So the French didn't like that. They wanted to come and have re-revolution in America. In 1785, the Columbian Lodge of the Order of the Illuminati was established in New York City. Oddly enough, the Illuminati were supported by some Americans, most notably Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson publicly defended Adam Weishaupt and attacked those who wrote exposures of the Illuminati. Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, charged that Jefferson had helped to foment the French Revolution. While the Reverend Jedediah Morse, the father of Samuel B. Morse, who invented the telegraph, declared that Jefferson was an Illuminatus. Like Weisopt and those who began the French Revolution, Jefferson had his own contempt for the gospel of Jesus Christ and set about to write his own version of it, now known as the Jefferson Bible. In a letter to John Adams, he wrote, In the New Testament, there is internal evidence that parts of it have proceeded from an extraordinary man and that other parts are of the fabric of very inferior minds. It is as easy to separate those parts as to pick out diamonds from dunghills. Among those parts of the gospel that Jefferson considered to be dunghills were things like the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus, and the resurrection of Christ, about which the apostle Paul wrote, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Yet all of these things were cut out of Jefferson's version of the New Testament. In the Bible, God says, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish anything from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. The Bible also says, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Concerning the book of Revelation, Jefferson wrote, it is between 50 and 60 years since I read it, and I then considered it merely the ravings of a maniac, no more worthy nor capable of explanation than the incoherences of our own nightly dreams. 
Jefferson's tombstone seems to best define his true faith, an Egyptian obelisk that he himself designed prior to his death. Like the all-seeing eye, the obelisk is a symbol of the ancient mystery religion, the same worship of Freemasonry and the Illuminati. The idea of the Illuminati or of a plan for the overthrow of nations was not always considered the stuff of conspiracy theorists and fanatics. It was written of by men like George Washington. So concerned was Washington over the Jacobin threat in America that he came out of retirement and again accepted the appointment of Commander-in-Chief of the Army to fight against the movement. In a letter to the Reverend W.D. Schneider in 1798, Washington wrote, I have heard of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati. It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more fully satisfied of this fact than I am. There are many such references concerning the presence of Illuminism in America. Reportedly, Harvard's Houghton Library contains numerous sermons, pamphlets, and books denouncing Illuminism or the Illuminati during the late 1790s and early 1800s. Warnings were even preached in churches, such as this 1812 sermon by the Reverend Joseph Willard, who said, there is sufficient evidence that a number of societies of the Illuminati have been established in this land of gospel light and civil liberty, which were first organized from the Grand Society in France. They are doubtless secretly striving to undermine all our ancient institutions, civil and sacred. In 1885, Monsignor George Dillon wrote, Communism is but a form of the illuminated masonry of Weisopt. The Russian Revolution, like the revolution in France, is often portrayed as the noble struggle of just men desiring to overthrow an unjust monarchy. But as with Weisopt and his inspired French revolt, a conspiracy against God is to be found at the very heart of it. In his book, Marx and Satan, author Richard Wormbrand exposes the truth about the man most credited with the communist idea. Marx began his life as a professing Christian, even writing a poem titled The Union of the Faithful with Christ in Favor of Christianity. But by the time he finished high school, somehow his heart had turned. In another poem he wrote, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. In a poem titled Pale Maiden, Marx wrote, Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well, my soul once true to God is chosen for hell. But Marx was not alone in his thoughts of damnation. He surrounded himself with like-minded fellows at the Internationale, a working man's association with a secret agenda. French historian E.E. E. Freiberg wrote, The Internationale everywhere found support in Freemasonry, while author William T. Still writes that The Internationale can hardly be viewed as anything but illuminized masonry in a new disguise. Among Marx's comrades were men like Mikhail Bakunin, who wrote, The evil one is the satanic revolt against divine authority. Satan, the eternal rebel, the first free thinker, and the emancipator of worlds. Then there was Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who wrote, Come, Satan, slandered by small and by kings. God is stupidity and cowardice. God is hypocrisy and falsehood. God is evil. Or Heinrich Hein, called the intimate friend of Marx, who wrote, I called the devil and he came, his face with wonder I must scan. He is not ugly, he is not lame, he is a delightful, charming man. Wormbrand writes that Marx and his comrades, while anti-God, were not atheists as present-day Marxists claim to be. That is, while they openly denounced and reviled God, they hated a God in whom they believed. When the revolution broke out in Paris in 1871, the Communard Florence declared, Our enemy is God. Hatred of God is the beginning of wisdom. Marx greatly praised the Communards, who openly proclaimed this aim. Such was the thinking of the men whose influence would change the world through communism, 
As Nesta Webster wrote, the Internationale became simply an engine of warfare against civilization. Just as the Jacobin Club had openly executed the hidden plan of the Illuminati, the Internationale, holding within it the same terrible secrets, carried on the work of world revolution. This revolution would next enter into Russia to overthrow Tsar Nicholas II and his family, who were brutally murdered on July 17, 1918. As with the French Revolution, the powers that took over were far more bloodthirsty and cruel than any monarch in Russia's history. The two chief instruments, Lenin and Trotsky, inspired a civil war that cost 28 million Russian lives. When Joseph Stalin inherited Lenin's legacy, he would be called the most dictatorial and murderous tyrant the world had ever known. His own daughter said of him, quote, a terrible demon had taken possession of my father's soul. It is now estimated by Soviet sources that Stalin's reign of terror killed 40 million Russians, a far greater death toll than what is so often attributed to Adolf Hitler. Sources claim that Europeans and Americans financed Lenin and Trotsky in their attempts to foment a revolution in Russia. Many have seen in this a global conspiracy. Among them was a young Winston Churchill, who made this statement where he tied it all together in a London newspaper in 1920. He said, From the days of Spartacus Weisacht, to those of Karl Marx, to those of Trotsky, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization has been steadily growing. It played a definitely recognizable role in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century. And now, at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. Yet in 1945, Churchill would be among the three leaders at the infamous meeting at Yalta, an historic event that many argue was a gigantic push for the New World Order. Is it possible that somehow Churchill's youthful convictions changed 25 years later? For now, he would sit in support of the very movement he sought to expose. The Soviet Union, under the bloody leadership of Joseph Stalin, was given power over half of Europe, a decision that would later lead to the murder of countless millions. It is said this was largely due to the efforts of Franklin D. Roosevelt. FDR was also responsible for putting the Masonic seal on the back of the U.S. dollar bill, with the all-seeing eye and the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, translated by many researchers as the New World Order. The Reverend Jim Shaw, a former 33rd degree Mason who left the order and wrote his book titled The Deadly Deception, was interviewed by a reporter in 1989. We read that concerning the famous picture at the Yalta conference, Reverend Shaw said, and there they were, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, all three Masons. Some may suggest that Yalta was simply the poor judgment of men who did not realize what they were doing. But is it possible? that a much greater agenda was at work. In 1830, Adam Weissop died at the age of 82. In time, the power of masonry and the Illuminati fell into the hands of two chief men, Albert Pike in the United States and a man named Giuseppe Mazzini, the head of Italian masonry, who is alleged to have said, quote, our final end is that of Voltaire and of the French Revolution, the destruction forever of the Christian idea. Together, Pike and Mazzini devised a diabolical plan to finally bring about the New World Order. In 1871, Mazzini issued a letter in which he outlined the final three-part plan for ridding not just Europe, but the entire world of Christianity, bringing it under the illuminated dictatorship of Luciferianism. Here in Washington, D.C., beneath a statue of Albert Pike, author William T. Still explains the contents of this remarkable letter. Uh, this was a letter that was written by the head of European masonry, a man by the name of Mazzini, who wrote, wrote it to Albert Pike about 1871. 
Uh, it was in the British Museum for a number of years on display, so we know it existed. It's now disappeared, incidentally. The subject of the letter was to try to figure out a way to finally get humankind uh, to give up their cherished concept of nationalism and finally give in to the New World Order internationalist construct. Uh, the letter called for a series of three world wars. The first war would uh, be to depose the Tsar in Russia so they could uh, uh, create uh, an experiment in the control of populations, have a nation to do that in. Then the Second World War would allow this new nation uh, to take control of Europe. Of course, they only got half of Europe, but that was the best they could do under the conditions after World War II. Then the Third World War would be between the Jews and the Muslims and would bring about the Battle of Armageddon and would finally make mankind so sick of warfare that they'd give up their cherished concept of nationalism and give in to their new, the New World Order concept. If these things are so, and if such a letter really did exist, what does this suggest about the world's conflict in the Middle East? And this is the number one problem that the United Nations faces today. Everybody knows it. Talking, everyone's afraid of, you know, what happens if you know, this powder cake starts off in the Middle East and maybe looking at World War III. Can this be the conspiracy of kings and rulers mentioned in the Bible? Mazzini wrote of the Third World War that it will provoke a formidable social cataclysm and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the multitude, disillusioned with Christianity, will receive the true light of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. The Bible says, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. The Bible says of the kings that shall come, these shall make war against the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of Kings. Therefore, O son of man, say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die? Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also who pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen.